Hello, this is IP Stories by 4IP Council, a podcast about innovation and intellectual property. Join us and you'll hear about the journeys through invention, creation, and IP understanding of our guests. I'm Marta. And I'm Axel. And today we are very happy to welcome to our podcast, Professor Els Engart. Els, welcome and thank you so much for having this chat with us. First of all, could you tell us more about yourself and your career? Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to contribute to this uh, adventure. Um, so I'm Els Henkart. I have an MD PhD from the University of um, Antwerp and Mount Sinai Medical School in New York. Um, actually, after graduating from medical school, I decided to do a PhD, which brought me to the United States, uh, more specifically New York, the Big Apple, uh, which was possible thanks to a fellowship, a Belgian American Educational Foundation Fellowship. Um, which um, yeah made me do research or allowed me to do research in stem cell biology. Then after graduating with a PhD, um, I switched fields completely, but I applied the knowledge that I learned um, in, uh, in my PhD to actually set up a model system to study the consequences of, of integration of a specific virus. And the virus is called adeno-associated virus. It's a very intriguing virus. It's uh, non-pathogenic, uh, and it's actually probably best known as a gene therapy vehicle uh, to transfer therapeutic transgenes uh, to patients with genetic diseases. Um, after my postdoc, I actually decided to move back to, to, the, to, to Europe. I didn't quite make it to the mainland. I landed in the United Kingdom, um, where I joined King's College London to set up my lab, still working on an adeno-associated virus, or AV for short. Um, where I was involved in research, uh, both on the fundamental aspects of the life cycle of the virus, uh, but also gene therapy applications. And in this context, we developed um, a new capsid, a neurotropic capsid, which means that it can be used as, as a vector to treat diseases uh, that affect the brain. Um, and that brought us actually to license this invention to, um, to a pharma company, a big one, a Pfizer, and led to um, quite a big collaboration with this pharma partner. Um, then Brexit happened. This made me think what the next steps should be. And uh, actually, at that point, also, I was thinking of expanding my activities, my industrial collaborations. Um, and I was looking for a university that is very good in, in, main, in, in help build these uh, collaborations and to help maintain them and expand them and uh, that search brought me actually to back to my home country funnily enough uh, back to Kailöwe where they have an incredibly strong uh, also internationally renowned tech transfer office um, and this is where I'm now uh, still continuing my activities but with an expansion uh, of these collaborations with industrial partners, uh, ranging from biotech companies, also still based in the UK, but also elsewhere, um, and um, pharma companies, and also with new spin-off companies under my belt. So perfect match with Kai Leuven. Okay, thank you Els, for that introduction. So you are a professor at KU Leuven um, with a strong academic background and teaching experience. Um, but you are also the CSO of the recently established spin-off, Tavira Therapeutics. Um, could you explain the relationship between the spin-off and KU11 and how you manage to combine those two roles? Um, yes, a pleasure to explain that. I mean, it, this is you know, one of the exciting things that I can do in the context of my work here at KU Leuven. Um, and that is to be able to combine both academic research, where I do like any old professor, I teach a little bit at the moment, and I do academic research, both fundamental as well as translational, translational in the context of gene therapy, where we try to develop gene therapies mainly for neurodegenerative diseases, and we do that in collaboration with different industrial partners. Um, and so with the spin-off, it's, it's not any different in that it actually starts from an academic idea. Um, and then you work on it, you expand upon it, and you make the, the invention stronger. And then when you realize that you actually have a solution to a problem in the field, in this case gene therapy, uh, the, the, the issue of delivery of actually targeting the vectors to specific tissues, made us think, well, let's go a bit further than academic research and make it work so that we actually have an innovative step that can be patented and that would then also give us the opportunity to search for funding that will allow us to 
to build and make an impact and and uh, actually eventually get to therapies because in the gene therapy field it's a complex field it's quite expensive and it needs multiple stakeholders from academics to biotech company to pharma to really make it work um, now that's easier said than done you know coming up with innovative ideas you need a little bit of guidance and that guidance clearly came from people in the tech transfer office live research and development where we basically started from the beginning you know pitching the idea to them and seeking where the innovative steps could be you know this context you know finding a way of hooking up targeting molecules peptides small molecules to capsids to target them to specific tissues for example uh, the liver um, or muscle and they helped us basically build the patents together with them and to um, also see what the next step would be, you know, if we're reaching out to investors and what kind of investors. The fact that I already had contact with investors in the network, of course, made it easier. Um, and then we built a company um, that's still in very early stage and what we call pre-seed. And so together with a team that uh, that consists of people from my team that, that will have complementary expertise from business to you know, technology development, we built this company up to the next stage of funding and to really help it mature and basically all of this is, is possible because we had a strong patent that underlies it all and because of the strong support that we received from the tech transfer office to help build these ventures and to help build innovation and how i combine it i have to admit you know this is you know a temporary situation because as soon as a company matures usually the pi from whose idea it stems steps steps down um, and then there is a so-called professional cso who has led companies in this kind of role before and they take over and that's usually associated with seed or you know series a funding bigger tickets of funding where we talk multiple millions in the context of, of, gen of uh, gene therapy development um, and why I can combine this is, is actually because I have a very good team that supports me in this and because I've got support from the tech transfer office um, and because I have the freedom at the university to combine this valorization um, um, activities together with my academic research. Um, That's very interesting. So it seems that my understanding is through your activities in KU Leuven and the spin-off, collaboration and building network has been really at the core um, of this success. But what could you tell us about building su successful collaborations with industrial partners? Um, good question. I think what you mentioned, the network is very important, right? And building that network should actually start from the first steps you, you set in academic research. You know, already when you do your PhD, it always helped by the fact that I did that in the United States or largely in the United States where networking and communication is, is you know, part of the training, it comes naturally. So there are all kinds of events organized that, that forced you almost to learn how to do this and to throw yourself into it and, and out there and make yourself you know, known and, and what you stand for. Um, so that was something that I profited from to having learned these skills. And then it's it also comes down to the reputation that you build. It needs, you need to be able to offer solid science. You need to have found you know, a bit of a gap in the market and you know, working with industry, it always, of course, needs to have a translational aspect. In this case, um, helping to find solutions for gene therapy on one hand, building the, the gene therapies, and at the other end, also making sure that innovation is, is part of it so that the bottlenecks that the field is running into are being solved as well. And that can be because you have come up with innovation that you license to a company, but it can also be that you have set up a collaboration to tackle these, these challenges together. Um, and, you know, what's amazing about this, this kind of tra trajectory is, is that you learn from these experiences, you learn from the industry, you learn how to do these things in a more professional setting. Uh, I think because in academics, we're trained to do things in a certain way um, and, and seeing what the other side does, you know, helps you really mature into, into a proper collaborator with industrial partners, if you will. Um, and then another aspect I already alluded to that in the previous answer is, is that you need the support because in setting up a collaboration with an industrial partner, um, you need support from several different people, from investment managers, um, but also from uh, patent people, from people who understand what contracts with industry means and from uh, lawyers, from attorneys that guide you through that process because these contracts are very complex and you need to make sure 
that you are not, um, how do you say, stopped in your tracks when it comes to freedom to operate, if you will, so that you can still do your innovation, your research, that you don't give away all your background knowledge for free and that you can still expand and that you don't exclusively give that knowledge and know-how and innovation away to the partner you're working with so that you can work with several different partners at the same time. So again, it's 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 possible when you're guided through this process and you're supported with the, the right people um, through this complex uh, process. I have a question for you um, as a professor. So what do you think should be the approach of a university to entrepreneurship and tech transfer? Um, I think that's probably a bit different uh, for every different university and depending on uh, how how they how much they already have built their tech transfer or their business uh, uh, department, if you will. Um, one important thing, at least for me, is, is education. Um, educating the scientists and, and, how do you say, getting them involved and, and making them understand what the benefits are from, you know, doing valorization research of coming up with patents, protecting your research and, and what possibilities it offers. At the end of the day, you know, having a patent, of course, creates for income, income not only for the university, but in our case, Kailleuve for the research group, which now allows you to do more research and more innovation. So understanding that concept uh, and having clear guidelines and courses around that, but also having a team that uh, you know that knows how difficult it is to rope in scientists, but then to gain their their confidence uh, or their um, that you that you speak the same language. That's where the education again comes in, and and they can build upon that um, because. I sense from colleagues, you know, throughout the years, there is usually um, hesitation to work with industry. There's a hesitation to come up with with innovation and to apply for patents, because they might not understand how exactly it works. And then having that team there to help through this and to educate uh, will 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 help universities to build that portfolio. Um, again, education is an important one, and then. Yeah, I think lead by examples. If you have a good case that was successfully built, even starting from a small tech transfer office, a small university, that can serve as an example and a role model to build upon. Um, so again, depending on, on the size of the university, the answer can be different. But I think there are possibilities in both ways for the larger tech transfer offices where they can find those people that they think have the mindset and capabilities to um to really get the most out of these collaborations, but they can also have initiatives where they ask people to come up with with um, proposals that they can then see if they will further guide to an innovation and to a spin-off, for example. What is else, in your opinion, the relationship between research and IP? Well, there should be a very intricate intricate uh, relationship between between both. Um, it it. It should not mean that all research needs to lead to patentability because you know that's wishful thinking. But if there is, if you're working on translational research and you want to make an impact in society, and that can be from different fields, but definitely also for the gene therapy field, uh, to increase your chance of it reaching the patient, um, you almost are forced to patent because that gives you many more opportunities again to seek that funding in different formats from licensing it out to the pharma partner that eventually will bring it to the patient, because as I said, it's complex, it's very expensive, and these academics cannot do this type of finalization of, of product building. You need a pharma partner that eventually does it and commercializes it. So that gives you these opportunities to really reach that impact that if you are into translational research um, is, a, is a very important one. And again, to do it right from the beginning to make sure that you have patented um, your invention, um, and that it's a solemn patent uh, before you, you share your information with colleagues, uh, before you go to a conference, uh, that is so important to really have that, that impact at the end of the day. So it looks like a virtuous cycle between research and IP. But has your interest in IP changed actually over the last few years, and especially now that being the founder of a biotech company? 
Um, yes, I would say it has changed. And again, it, it comes back to that educational bit. I mean, I learn on the go and I learn from the people that I'm surrounded with. I learn from the colleagues at, at LRD, the tech transfer office. I learn from colleagues. Uh, I learn from role models and, and, and people that I interact with. So a better understanding of how you build IP. I think I did the same as probably many people in academia do. You know, is my invention inventive enough? And, and then you discard it. Well, no, and you start looking for patents and you think, well, no, it's not inventive enough. But then when you start talking to patent attorneys and you're guided, then you realize, well, I can create inventive steps. I have to actually lead my research in a particular direction so that I'm sure that I can have all these inventive step included and I end up with a solid patent. So, and then seeing what it leads to as in spin-off and hopefully, you know, making, getting it to solve the bottlenecks and getting it translated into therapies that are then picked up by industry to reach those patients um, is, is when you go full circle, you fully realize, you know, what the value is um, and it opens opportunities that it causes in my case, a lot of excitement and I think the same holds true for the team that keeps us going um, every day um, to to reach that final goal. So um, I have a, a, a bit of a difficult question. <laughs> so um, I would like to know what has been the biggest challenge that you had to face during your career? That is the ultimate difficult question because I can think of, of many. Um, the one thing is, and, and, and I think scientists, all scientists have it, and maybe female scientists have it and even stronger, is like, am I doing the right thing? Am I on the right track? Am I solid enough? Um, am I loud enough um, to basically find your unique space and position and believe in it uh, and also share that um, with the people around you and, and train the next generation to do it right? Um, um, is, is in general, is, is a challenge that I'm faced with every day. And, and if I may add, combining it with a healthy life outside the lab um, is one that, that balance you need to find every day. But I think I found it. I have a happy family um, and I hope to continue um, from that energy to continue build um, on this academic and translational track. That's very interesting because along your career, it seems that you have change but there is a leading you know leading topic across all the experience um, but from this rich experience what is in your opinion um, what you are the most proud of actually like personal or professional achievements yeah, the, the most proud of actually of the pedigree that I've created, the, the people who successfully completed a, a PhD, who then went on to take jobs in academia, in, in industry, and then actually having the opportunity to loop back to those people and have a collaboration with them. One of my my you know fond memories of the time we spent together, PhD student she um, that was in King's College. She came from America. Um, she did a fantastic PhD, and then now again we're collaborating because she is working for a biotech company that we have a research collaboration with to actually see these people flourish and 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 do well. I think that's what I'm most proud of. They're somehow my children um, as well, and to have it continue and to actually see them get better than, than myself, I find it a beautiful one. Um, and I learn from them, which is, is an amazing realization, I find. You learn from the people you've trained or that you surround yourself on a daily basis. And that can be from personal learnings to, to professional uh, learnings. It's a great, great thing. Very good. And uh, maybe more, uh, you know, a curious question from my side, how do you envision the future of gene therapy? Um, again, a very good question because we're at the moment at a very peculiar stage. So we've seen great developments and there are great developments coming uh, again because we have lots of products, of uh, prospective products and clinical trials. Um, but if you go back into, into history of gene therapy, a lot of these inventions and, and developments of gene therapy assets came from academia. 
to do the final step of this development, they then formed spin-offs, and mostly in the United States. Um, and then these were bought by pharma companies. And at the same time, so that was for pharma companies a way into this new therapeutic modality, which comes with lots of challenges because the industry is not used to them. Lots of things still have to be tweaked to really make it work and, and work reliably. There are technical hurdles and so on. Um, so they started building their their internal pipeline together with acquisition of, of these companies that had the expertise. And this is a phase that's now finalized and, in, and pharma companies are now realizing actually we have the experience, we know what it takes, we can bring products to the market, but we realize it's actually very expensive and very risky. Um, and what we're probably going to see is, and you already see it, some big pharma companies are, um, not, are, are stepping down their gene therapy efforts. They sell part of their assets to other pharma companies that are still new to the field. So they're probably going to go into the more conservative phase. That doesn't mean that they're not interested, but they want to do the de-risking by academia and by biotech companies. So the responsibility comes back to academia um, to basically de-risk it and, 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 sh and bring a package to the biotech and the industry to show, okay, this works. Um, here is why it works and why it's worthwhile for them investing in. That, of course, takes a special setup, a special ecosystem, because... You cannot afford as an academic to basically um, not do it according to the rules that pharma will expect. So the quality um, and the way the data package is built needs to be done to what's to the highest standard. And for that, you need to create an, ecos an ecosystem where all these different um, partners are involved, the biotech, the, um, the pharma, to actually collectively work on it. Um, and also the institute that's hosting these researchers needs to be ready for this. Um, and, and there need to be ways of finding funding to do that kind of research because we're talking about getting ready to do a clinical trial for gene therapy. This is very expensive. Um, so funding agencies need to think about it. Uh, the European Commission is very much involved in this and they know the challenge, especially for Europe. Uh, so in the context of rare diseases, there are initiatives that I'm also part of together with other uh, PIs in, in Europe. So there needs to be some kind of a, sh a shift in thinking um, that the academic as well as the pharma world will have to go through and support each other to have all these rare diseases actually see their therapies um, and reach patients. Um, so a bit of a shift, but I think it, it, then we still have a lot to learn, but it will eventually land and it might take a bit more time. But I think beyond those six products that we have now, there will be more to come, but it might be a different, a different way of getting there. Um, hopefully we, we are successful and, and many more uh, will follow. So I'm afraid we are reaching the end of the interview, Els, um, but I have one more question for you. Um, I would like to know if you have any recommendations for other universities, researchers or students. Yeah, I think for, I'm going to start with the students. Um, getting back to, to aspects that I already alluded to is throw yourself out there, you, you know, get, get the courage together to talk to people, find yourself a role model, a role models in the different aspects of research you do that can range from teaching to uh, valorization research, uh, go to courses, listen to people, meet people at conferences and, and, and go after your passion. I mean, passion is so important and that passion and vision for university, for university is, is important and going back to this new host institute that I'm at is, is finding a place where you feel the freedom and the support to do, to go on your own track that maybe is a bit off track when you compare it to other um, colleagues or other universities um, gives gives comfort and I think this is a good breeding ground for, for innovation and opportunities. Um, and that's what you always need to be on the lookout for. Uh, and it might it might take lots of advice from other people. So listening and learning is an important one. Thank you so much, Els, for taking the time to have in this chat with us. Yes, it has been a great pleasure to have you with us today. I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to IP Stories by 4IP Council. Visit our website on 4IPCouncil.eu to find out more and check out the links mentioned during this episode. 
if you liked it, remember to share and subscribe.